Okay, well, let's kick off Wednesday night. One book in one class. You ready? That's our... <laughs> okay, we are, this week we are in the book of Numbers. And traditionally, Numbers is a book that people want to skip because they assume it's all numbers and it's kind of boring. But today, I think we will see differently, guys. The book is called uh, Numbers. It gets its name from the Septuagint, which is very strange because the Hebrew name of this book is called In the Wilderness. In the Wilderness. That's a little more exciting title. So that's the original name in the Hebrew. Some of the highlights that we'll hit real quick, and then I'll do the outline. Um, the distance that they travel, if you remember, in, Ex in uh, Genesis, we left off in Goshen. And then in Exodus, we're in Goshen, and we Exodus out of Goshen, and we go to Mount Sinai. In Leviticus, we stay in Mount Sinai. And in Numbers, we're still in Mount Sinai. So they spend one year camping out at Mount Sinai. Generally, uh, progressive from Genesis on. Yeah, you some got some of the other books. They talk, tell about the same things. That yes. Talk about before and after. Yes, and like First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. Those books are all about the same story. Uh, just one of them was written after the exile, and one was written before an exile. So it gets them a little bit different. Um, so. In Numbers, we're still camped out at Mount Sinai. It has been one year. One year. <clears throat> and um, what we're going to travel from uh, Mount Sinai all the way to a place called uh, the Moab. The plains of Moab. Basically, if we got the Red Sea and then the Jordan and then the... Um, is it Galilee? See a Galilee at the top? Anyway, we travel all the way over to the east side of the Jordan... And they camp out right there at Moab, and they can see Jericho across the Jordan. So that's where we're going to end up. It should take about two weeks to travel from Sinai to that place in Moab. In our case, it takes them 40 years, and we'll, we'll see why. Um, at this time, Egypt was one of the world powers, so Egypt had conquered this whole area all the way that they were going to be traveling in, so they were going to be concerned about that. Um, Israel has been camped out at Mount Sinai since the Exodus through Leviticus, and now we're still camped here until the 10th chapter. We'll start to move away from Mount Sinai. There are two censuses taken in the book of Numbers. One is in Numbers chapter 1, and the other one is in Numbers chapter 26, and there's a very specific reason to take this census, so we'll want to know about that. And uh, basically the book, the easiest way to break it up, I think, is into three parts, uh, they start at Mount Sinai, then they travel, they end up at the wilderness of Paran, which is about halfway to their destination to Canaan. Then they travel again, and they end up at the plains of Moab on the east side of the Jordan, looking over into Canaan land and Jericho. So we'll do the first section, uh, chapters 1 through 10, Mount Sinai. In the first four chapters, there is a census, and there is the organizing of the people. If you imagine... When we left off um, in Goshen, there was only 70 people. And now that we're traveling through the wilderness, there's over 2 million people. So some things have to be done to create organization. And how do you move 2 million people through the wilderness? Um, so the first thing that's done is there is a census taken. What's interesting about this census is it's a military census. That makes a big deal. That's a different than what Mary and Joseph did when they went to Bethlehem. That was just a... Uh, a Roman census. This is a military census, which means after we count how many men we have, we're going to go to war. So that's kind of interesting because we might see that in Revelation as well. There's a census in Revelation. It's good to know that. So this is a military census. They only count the men 20 years old and older. So when we see 600,000, really it's 600,000 fighting men plus women and children and however other. So it's a military census. Troop census before going into battle was common warfare plans for the ancient places like Akkad, Assyria, summer, summer. This was a normal thing to do, a census right before you were to go to war. The other thing that's very interesting uh, that we get in chapters 1 through 4 is the organization of this 2 million person camp. We've built a tabernacle, so the tabernacle is going to be right here in the middle. And what's fascinating is... 
the organization of the camp that God tells him is he has the Levites camping all the way around the tabernacle, and then you have the various tribes of Israel in different north, south, east, west. The fact that he put the Levites, the priests, around the tabernacle in between God's presence and Israel is going to be a very big deal in just a little bit. So he positions the priests there, uh, and I'll go ahead and read that to you. Leviticus chapter 1, uh, Numbers chapter 1 and verse 53, 52 actually. Numbers 1 and 52. The people of Israel shall pitch their tents by their companies, each man in his own camp, each man by his own standard. But the Levites shall camp around the tabernacle of the testimony so that there may be no wrath on the congregation of the people of Israel. We've been talking about God's holiness and how um, you can't be in the presence of holiness if you're tainted with sin. And so it's interesting that he puts priests between him and the people. Uh, there has to be something that exists between God and rebellious people. And we'll see that play out differently in the New Testament. Uh, laws about purity, chapters 5 through 9. Uh, the silver trumpets in chapter 10. Chapter 10 is interesting because he has him make silver trumpets. And the purpose of the trumpets is that the cloud is about to lift off of the tabernacle for the first time. And when the cloud lifts, what are people supposed to do? Get ready to move. So they make these two silver trumpets in chapter 10. Chapter 10 is really interesting. That's the pivotal point. And um, they're going to start to move. They build these trumpets in order to get 2 million people. And he tells them how they're going to move out of the camp. If you want to uh, make a little note, Numbers chapter 10, verse 11. Numbers chapter 10, verse 11. If you'd put a little note there and write Exodus 19.1. Exodus 19.1, right next to Numbers 10.11. Because Exodus 19.1 tells you the date of when they got to uh, Sinai, and Numbers 10 tells you that one year later, they're leaving Mount Sinai for the first time. So chapter 10, everybody's picking up and moving. We've got two verses that record the maiden voyage. Chapters 11 and 12 record the trip. And you may remember some things about the trip. Uh, in this first one, we're hungry, we're thirsty. Why did we leave Egypt? We had free fish, cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. Why did we ever leave Egypt to come to this desolate place? That's Numbers 11.5. You can imagine the weight on Moses' shoulders. Moses is saying, why? Moses talks to God and he tells God, why is this my problem? These are your people. They're all complaining to me, why, how did this become my problem? So Moses is stressing out, and Moses is wondering, where am I going to get enough cows and enough sheep and enough fish to feed all these people, two million people? He literally is trying to figure out where he's going to get meat from. God's answer in chapter 11 is, is my arm so short? I'll give these people meat until it comes out their nose. And that's literal. So that, that comes from uh, chapter 11 there. So and, not wild sheep? No, 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 quail. He sends quail, but he's upset with the people being short and wanting to go back to Egypt because one rule he gives them is you can never go back to Egypt. Never go back to Egypt is a rule. We'll want to remember that as we go through the rest of the Old Testament. So he sends them quail till it's coming out their nose, but he also sends a plague to punish them for being rebellious. In chapter 2, after the people get done being angry at Moses... Uh, Aaron and Miriam, his brother and sister, get mad at Moses. They're sick and tired of being out here. This is chapter 12. They're sick and tired of being out here, and they badmouth Moses, and they say, who do you think you are, Moses? Why should you be the boss of us? God comes in and says, the scripture says, Moses was very meek. I thought that that was just an interesting phrase for those of us that are a little more softer spoken. It says, Moses was very, very meek. And yet he was leading a group of two million people. So God came to stand in for Moses. And uh, he tells them, the three of you, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, meet me at the door to the tent of meeting. And then the Lord comes down in a pillar of a cloud 
and he stands at the entrance of the tent to speak to these three people. Numbers chapter 12 and verse 6. We're going to read that. Numbers 12 and 6. And then he said, hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision, and I speak to him in dreams. But not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house, and with him I speak mouth to mouth. Clearly, not in riddles, and he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then are you not afraid to speak this way to my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. So God basically let them know who his favor was resting on. And he'll have to do this again shortly. Um... So that's their trip, a bunch of complaining and Moses feeling all the pressure. After that little two-chapter, I think that was about a 12-day walk, something like that. We get to chapter 13, so the next section is the wilderness of Paran, a desolate wilderness. It looked like uh, the Vantage, Vantage Highway, if you guys know the Vantage Highway, right? That's <laughs> what it looked like. So um, they're halfway now to the promised land. They've walked about... 12 days? I think back then they walked 17 miles a day. So some, some who knows? Something in there. Um, they're about halfway there. So if we break down the wilderness of Paran, what happens there? Chapters 13 through 14, they send the spies out from there to go spy on Canaan, to go see what the land looks like. And we get this phrase from this section. Once they get to the wilderness of Paran, they go spy out the land. What goes there? Yes. Thank you, Ryan. Let's go. Ah, there you go. Ten say no, two say go. Moses begs the ten not to rebel because they're getting angry again. They don't want to go in and have to fight these people that look intimidating. When Moses stands up to them, uh, the group gets together and say, let's stone. This is all in chapter 14, verses 5 through 10. Let's stone Moses, Aaron, Joshua, and Caleb. I can't imagine the pressure that was on these mere mortals. Let's stone these guys. God gets angry and... The ten that said no, die of a plague. So God shows where his favor is. Then God gets upset, and we should pick up this uh, uh, phrase here, Numbers, Numbers 14 and verse 11. And this is a, a critical phrase, critical phrase for our New Testament theology, guys. <clears throat> Numbers 14, verse 11 the Lord said to Moses, how long will this people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me? Despite all the signs I have performed amongst them. So these people crossed uh, the, the sea on dry land. They saw the plagues on Egypt and Pharaoh. They witnessed all of this. Um, do you think they didn't believe in God? Like they didn't think God was there? They, they, knew, they know God's real. So why would he say they don't believe in me when they refuse to go into Canaan? Boom, boom, boom. So there's the words. Uh, God tells them to go into Canaan and they say no. They say no. And when they are not obedient, he says, you guys don't believe in me. Otherwise, you would have gone. Uh, just a reminder of how this breaks down. Abraham is who uh, the children of the promise are supposed to uh, copy themselves, emulate themselves as Abraham. So remember, God told Abraham he would give him an entire nation. And he said, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as 
righteousness. So there's the belief. But then a little later on, God comes along, and what's he going to do to Abraham? Tests. tests Abraham. God tests Abraham, says, I need you to offer me your very first son. And it, the scripture says, and Abraham obeyed. And you want to know how in the world could someone do that? How, how could someone do that? And the idea comes from Hebrews. And I forgot exactly where it's at, guys. But it said, Abraham had faith in God that he could give him back his son from the dead. So the only way somebody could do something seemingly impossible. It was seemingly impossible when he got his son. Yes, yes. So there's this little trinity here, believe, obey, faith, that uh, seems to kind of double over on itself, and this tests the genuineness of people. And when someone refuses to obey, God always gets angry. We're going to see it in Psalms. And he goes, if you're not willing to obey me, then you don't really believe in me. So that's very interesting, guys. Um. The faith of Abraham and Israel does not possess it, except for the, the two tribes. So then God says, well, okay, then here's what we're going to do. You don't want to go into the promised land. Guess what? You don't have to go into the promised land. God gives them what they want. And let's see what they look like here. Numbers 14 and verse 22. Numbers 14 and 22. God says, so then, none of the men who have seen my glory and the signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and yet have put me to the test these ten times, they have not obeyed my voice, none of them shall see the land that I swore to give to their fathers. None of those who have despised me shall see it. God is angry, but he gives the people what they want. No promised land for them, and we know they'll end up wandering for 40 years instead of the promised land. Chapter 15 is more laws, and there is an interesting verse in chapter 15 because they are going to need this verse. Once again, God is going to give them what they need ahead of time. They're not going to pay attention to it. Numbers 15, 39, he said, just because this is a wicked generation, I'm going to try to help you guys out. I'm going to try to protect you. Numbers 15 and 39, what God asks them to do is he asks them to put four tassels on the end of their garments. <clears throat> put these four tassels on the ends of your garments, and we'll pick up in 1539, and it shall be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments that the Lord to do them and do not follow after your own heart, after your own eyes, because you are inclined to whore after them. Ooh, this is rated. This is rated R. This section here. <laughs> this is TV mature. So you are inclined to listen to your own heart. You're inclined to listen to your own eyes. <clears throat> and both of these cause you to do bad. Therefore, put these tassels on the ends of your robes, right? And every time you look at these, remember my commandments. That's going to be important, so we'll come back to that. The accusations begin to fly. Whoops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's 15. Chapter 16, uh, this is a story that we will want to learn because it's referred to in the New Testament. This is called Koraz. Rebellion, Korah's Rebellion. This is an important story. Um, Jude chapter 11 refers them back to this story. So we want to know what happened. Korah's Rebellion, uh, the background, Korah was obviously one of the tribe members there in Israel. He was born from a prominent family. He becomes arrogant. And just like Miriam and Aaron, he wants to usurp Moses' authority. Doesn't like being under Moses. Uh, he goes around and he allies with 250 prominent men in Israel. So he first gets a group of people to come along with him. 
prominent. Yes. Um, so then he approaches Moses, and they're like, hey, Moses, we don't think you're so special. You're no better than us. I think we're all basically good. We're all basically holy, and there's no reason for you to be the boss of us. So we'll look at number 16 and verse 3. And this is called Korah's Rebellion. Numbers 16 and 3. They assembled themselves together against Moses, against Aaron, and they said, You guys have gone too far, for all in the congregation are holy. We're all basically good people. We're all holy, every one of us. And the Lord is amongst us. So they're thinking they have the Lord's favor. Why then do you exalt yourself above the assembly of the Lord? So they think they're all pretty good and pretty hot stuff. Do you guys remember this drawing, though? Okay, so they should know what God thinks of them. What did God think of this outer group of people? Why did God put these guys between him and the outer group? They were rebellious. And if these priests weren't in the way, I would kill you guys. <laughs> they don't think so. They think, you know what? We're all basically holy and the Lord is amongst us. That's kind of a creepy idea <clears throat> that people can think they are good with God. Me and God were good. And yet God says, if it wasn't for somebody interceding, I would be striking you dead. Accusations begin to fly against Moses. You said you were bringing us to the land of milk and honey, and there is no milk and there is no honey. So Moses said, well, let's do a test to see who God favors. All of you guys, uh, go light some incense in a burner that you can carry around with you. And he tells them all to stand back, except for Korah and his people and his tents. And he tells everybody else, I want you to all get away from Korah and his tents. And let's see what happens. Let's see who God favors. Numbers 16 and verse 31. Numbers 16 and 31. Keep in mind, we're all basically good. We're all basically holy. God loves us all. What gives you the right to be our boss, Moses? Moses says, well, let's see. Everybody get away from Korah's area. And here we go, 16 and verse 31. As soon as he had finished speaking all these words, the ground under them split apart. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the people who belonged to Korah and all their goods, so that they and all that belonged to them went down alive into Sheol. The earth closed over them and they perished from the midst of the assembly. All Israel who was around them fled at their cry, and they said, Lest the earth swallow us up too. Then fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who had allied themselves with Korah. Not a good plan. Israel continues to grumble. Now Israel is upset with Moses because a lot of people have died. So they're upset with Moses and uh, God sends out a plague on the people to stop their rebellion, their fussing. And uh, 14,700 people die in the plague. Numbers chapter 16 and verse 49. Numbers 16 and verse 49. Plague goes out to consume them. Those who died in the plague were 14,700 besides all of those that died in the affair of Korah. And Aaron returned to Moses at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and the plague was stopped. Now you can imagine why God has to use such extreme measures. It's because you've got two million people sitting out there. If somebody doesn't do something to keep order, how is Moses and Aaron going to stand up to two million people? So God has to make his voice loud and clear. Um, sends the plague out. It, let's see, Israel didn't see themselves through God's eyes. And I referred back to Numbers 153. The Levites should camp around the tabernacle of the testimony so that there will be no wrath on the congregation. It reminds me of when Jesus says, why do you call me good? 
Don't call me good because no one is good except for the Father. It's too bad these guys didn't realize that. Chapter 17, God is going to do something to show all of Israel again who he favors. He already did that once in front of the tabernacle with Aaron and Miriam. Now God is going to show all of Israel who he favors to lead them. And in chapter 17, we have Aaron's rod. Uh, What they do in 17, each person from the different tribes of Israel, the head person gives Moses their staff or their rod. So you have basically 12 rods, one from each tribe. Moses goes in and puts all the rods in the tabernacle, which for them is the presence of God. Puts all the rods in there. The next day, Moses walks in there and says, whichever rod has budded, bloomed, uh, is going to be the person that has God's favor. So he goes in, brings out all the rods, and Aaron's rod had bloomed and had sprouted almonds. So that was God's way of showing Israel who they should follow. After that, we get into the second voyage. We're all going to pick up. The silver trumpets are going to sound. The smoke is going to leave the tabernacle. They've got to tear down the tabernacle. They've got to put the Ark of the Covenant and everything in front. And then they all march out of this area. And they're headed to their ultimate last stage. Uh, The second voyage is two chapters, chapter 20, 21. Again, as soon as they start traveling, what do the kids do in the car in the first 50 miles of your vacation? Exactly. They complain, we're thirsty, we're unhappy. This is a horrible place you brought us to. And Moses gets fed up. And I I, I, I can understand that, right? Have you ever had to pull the car over and, and shut the gas off and go, If I have to turn around one more time, Moses gets fed up. Does anybody know what he does? We're thirsty. What does Moses do? He strikes a rock. He doesn't do it the way God wanted him to do it. God wants everybody to see that when Moses submits himself to God, God provides what they need. But this time, Moses didn't want to humble himself. He strikes a rock. And because of that, God says, you don't get to enter the promised land either, Moses. There's something in that message that says, you know, and we're going to see it in the letter to Pergamum on Sunday. The people in the church in Pergamum are under a lot of pressure and they're messing up a little bit. And the story is, even if you're under a lot of pressure, you can never justify a sin, right? Uh, that's, that's basically the background. So Moses gets the same punishment The people rebel again in chapter 21. They start fighting in the wilderness. And so God says, you guys have so much time to fight and fuss amongst yourself. I'm going to give you something to do. Chapter 21, they start having to battle a lot of the people that are in the wilderness as they're traveling through. So they have to fight um, the king of the Canaanites and they win. They have to fight the king of the Amorites and they win. And they have to fight the king of Bashan. And they win there as well. But they're still grumbling. They're still angry. So God sends fiery serpents into the camp. Try to wake these people up and get their attention. That's in chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. Fiery serpents go into the camp. God wants to get their attention. And as scary as that sounds, he also provides, I hate to use the word atonement, God provides a way out. How does God provide the way out? There you go. I don't know what it looks like, but it ain't like right. You can't help but think if if you guys get bit, if you guys get stung, you're gonna die. Unless you turn and look at the guy on the snake. What's interesting about this, this is a a bronze snake or a gold snake. I can't remember. Bronze. Do you guys remember what the second commandment was? Do not make for yourself. Do not make for yourself any images. Do not cast or form anything. And yet here God tells him to do this. Okay. 
at the direction of God. So that's very good. That's what I wanted to say is even though God may have a rule, God himself can overrule it or whatever he wants to do. Interesting about this is uh, Israel will keep this, and at some point Israel starts to worship this thing, and God gets upset with them, wants them to break it and break it to pieces. So it's interesting that that comes to that. Uh, so they arrive in Moab. You would think they'd learned their lesson by now. God gave them the four tassels on their garments to remind them to obey him. They arrive in Moab, and this is where we're going to stay. This is where we're going to end up. They fought a lot of battles to get there. Multiple victories. Um, they're approaching the end of their 40 years. And so you guys remember, none of these original people are going to get to enter the kingdom, so they're all going to stay on the east side of the Jordan. This first generation is dying off, and now you would think they could rest, but we have a new problem. The king of Moab, the king of the area where they land, has noticed these two million people fighting all these other Canaanites, Amorites, and he's been hearing about all the victories that these guys are having, and he doesn't particularly like having them in his backyard. So when Israel gets here, Israel starts to grumble again. They're upset, they're angry, they're mad at God, and this is something uh, just beautiful to me, guys, that they don't realize um, I'll try to draw something here. Okay, so there is this mountain. Israel is down here in a valley. Oh, let's draw their tent, right? Israel is down here in a valley, and they're angry, and they're complaining, and they're setting up the tent, and they're kicking stuff. They don't like this one bit. What they don't realize is there's two people up here on this hill looking down at them. One of them is the king of Moab and the other guy is a guy named Balaam of Peor. Balaam of Peor. This is an important uh, uh, lesson because the New Testament will repeat this. You guys are doing the wickedness of Balaam. We're going to see it in the church in Pergamum uh, this Sunday in Revelation. You guys are following the teachings of Balaam. So this is an important story for us. This guy, the king, doesn't like Israel in his backyard, and he wants all of them dead. Balaam, that name uh, comes from the Hebrew Balaam, conqueror of people. This guy was some kind of a prophet. He was a pagan. He was a wicked person. And for payment, he could curse people for you. That was what he did. For money, he could curse people. He could do stuff. So the king of Moab hires Balaam to put a curse on Israel because he doesn't want them around. Balaam goes and he decides to seek out the God of Israel to tell him about this curse. He actually gets to talk to God, chapter 22. This is chapters 22 through 25. And this is where God speaks back to Balaam, actually has a conversation with him and says, I do not permit you to curse Israel, period. In fact, I want you to bless Israel. And so Balaam is this famous saying, I believe it's in chapter 22 and 18. Let's go ahead and look at that. 22 and 18. Famous saying, and now this is a pagan bad guy. And when God says, I do not allow you to curse Israel, look at what Balaam says. 22 and 18. Balaam answered back to the servant of Balak. Balak is the king of Moab. Even though Balak were to give me his whole house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord my God to do less or more. So you two please stay here tonight that I may know more of what the Lord will say to me. Here is a pagan bad guy saying, I cannot do anything that the Lord has told me I can't do. <clears throat> Interesting is... Um, Israel is going to need to remember what God told them in Numbers 15. I gave you tassels on your gown to remind yourself to obey my commandments. Don't follow after your heart. Don't follow after your eyes because you are inclined to whore after them. Well, they should be looking down. Oh, by the way, so what Israel is down here grumbling, they don't realize that these guys up here want to kill them and God is protecting them. 
That's an amazing story. God is protecting these people even while they're grumbling and upset. They don't even realize they're in danger. Um, 25, Balaam figures out a different way to go ruin Israel. Chapter 25, um, 25, Numbers 25, let's see. Let's see we'll pick up reading there. Okay, yeah. Chapter 25, verse 1. While Israel lived in Shittim, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. So I'm just going to summarize this. Um, the Moabite Balaam tells Balak, we can't pronounce a curse, so here's what we'll do. Let's send women into the camp to tempt the Israelites and see if they'll succumb to our women. So they grab women from Moab, where they're at, and Midia, or Midianites. And these women go into the uh, camp of the Israelites, and they do tempt the Israelite men. Even after God said, better look at those four tassels on your garment. The women go in, they tempt the men, and uh, it says uh, in Numbers 25, they play the harlot. 25 in verse 2, after they've uh, attracted the men, they get the men to offer sacrifices to false gods. Verses 6 through 7, after they've offered sacrifices, they get them to celebrate the sacrificial feasts, eating the food that you've sacrificed, which was always a big no-no. Got them to eat the food that they sacrificed and then commit again to fornication. God gets upset. A plague breaks out. And if you guys remember uh, the priest named Phineas, anybody remember Phineas? Phineas is the one that puts this plague to a stop. And the way he does it is he gets a spear and he notices a guy and a girl entering a tent together. Phineas goes and catches them in the act and drives the spear right through both partners. And that's when God relents and quits punishing the Israelites for their immorality. So that is the story of Balaam. The Balaam incident is basically Balaam was an evil person who was willing to do evil in order to profit. And the way he did it was tempting the Israelites with sexual immorality and idolatry. It's very interesting because those words, idolo, idolo, sounds like Spanish, doesn't it? Idols. Porneia is the word, porneia. Sounds like our pornography. Those are the two words that we see throughout the dealings with Balaam. And when you get into the New Testament, uh, we're, we're going to see in Pergamum on Sunday, porneia and idolo are the same problems that the Christians are struggling with. I just thought briefly I would touch on the idea way back here in whatever this is, 1400 years before Christ, God said to kill whatever was evil. And the fact that they didn't meant that evil bled its way into the New Testament. And it's just an interesting story to think about. He says, uh, beware of the leaven, the yeast, because a little bit of leaven goes through the whole piece of bread. So the idea in the Old Testament when God wanted to kill off sin, it sounds so brutal when we read it, but really what God was saying is, if you don't get rid of this, it's going to infest everything and everyone. After this happened, um, Balaam, let me read you, Philo and Josephus, the Jewish historians, they say Balaam was the most influential pagan prophet in Israel's history. So he was notorious. Rabbinical quote, to lead the people into sin is worse than murder. And that's worth thinking about for a little while because if you murder someone, they're just gone and out of the picture. But if you can lead them to sin, now you've got two people sinning. And if they can lead someone to sin, now you've got four people sinning. And before you know it, it's like Amway, right? <laughs> that's, a, that's the pyramid the pyramid scheme. Sin is like a pyramid scheme, okay? If you can get one, you can get two. If you can get two, you can eventually get four. If you can get four, eventually you can get eight. And that's the problem with sin. It's the problem with sin. That's why God always wanted to stamp it out. And that's why, mercilessly, at the end of Revelation, what is God going to do? Stamp out all sin 
so that his people can no longer be infected. Okay, treating sin like cancer. Why is it good news when you hear a, a, a cancer patient, hear a doctor say, we caught it early? Why is that good news? You can stop it from spreading, just like sin. Why is it bad news when he says, you've got cancer and we've caught it too late? What does that mean? It's already spread all over the place. What an image, what an image of what sin does. We caught it early, let's get rid of it. We caught it too late, can't do anything. Um, Romans 6.15, we won't look at it, but there is a special phrase there that means um, in 6.1, it says, should we go on sinning so that grace may increase? That means, can we just keep repeating sins? The obvious answer to that is no. The harder one is in 6.15. In 6.15, he says, you cannot... Oh, I have to look it up now. But the phrase changes. Basically, he says, even one sin, you can't justify even one sin. That's not the purpose of grace, to justify sin. Let's see what it is. 6.15. What then, can we sin because we are not under law. So he switches from, shall we continue sinning? Obviously, no. But in 15, he says, is it okay to sin because we're not under law? He, he talks about even one, and the whole premise there, guys, obviously there's forgiveness in grace, but the whole premise is, if you allow one, you're in danger of allowing. That's the idea. A new generation, 26 through 36. We're, we're in the clear here. 26 through 36, what we see is a new generation is starting to grow up. The old generation is starting to die. And, oh, interesting. In chapter 6, they take a census. What does that mean? You're going to war. You guys are going to war. The difference between a, a, a war census and a normal census is the war census only counts men and only counts men from 20 years old and older and in Revelation, we're going to see a census where they count up the people. There's 144,000 of them. And there's 144,000 virgin men. So that right there is your key that this is a military census and we're going to war. The idea of them being virgin men is, uh, do you guys remember when Uriah, David slept with Bathsheba? He brings Uriah in from the war, tells him to go sleep with his wife so he can cover up what he did. Do you guys remember what Uriah did? Slept on the portico, stayed guarding the palace and guarding the king. He kept working because he said, I forget what the word is, but there you go. When the country is at war, army men do not sleep with their wives. It's not something you do. So in Revelation, when we read that these men are all virgins, it really meant that they were being chased. They were not involved with their wives. Why? Because in wartime, you don't involve yourself in civilian affairs. Very interesting, these censuses. They really help us understand a lot later on. So there's a census in chapter 26. It means we're going back to war. He refines some of the Levitical sacrifices. You guys remember when we went through Leviticus? Um, there was all those sacrifices, but I said he tells you what to sacrifice, and he tells you how to sacrifice it. He doesn't tell you when to sacrifice it, and he doesn't tell you where to sacrifice it. Well, here in Numbers, chapters 28 through 29, you get when and you get where. So this whole sacrificial thing is evolving as we go through the book, chapters 28 and 29. Uh, so if you wanted to put a note, guys, chapters 28 and 29, in chapter 28, I would put a note to send yourself back to Leviticus 23. Chapters 28 and 29 of Numbers send you back to Leviticus 23, and it, it fills out the idea of sacrifices. Chapter 31, uh, God says, God tells Moses, I want you to go get vengeance on the Midianites. The Midianites were the women that came in and defiled Israel. God tells Moses, I want you to go kill all those people. And then guess what, Moses? You get to die. After they kill off the Midianites, they plunder all of their wealth. So Israel grows rich by killing these people that made them fall. Uh, and Balaam, the guy that seduced them, Balaam is killed by the sword. Uh, chapter 32, they settle in the Transjordan. 
Chapter 33 is interesting. I put a star by 33. That might be worth reading. Chapter 33 is a summary of the triumphant march all the way from Egypt to Moab. So chapter 33 in one chapter, you can read all the places they camped and all the places they stayed from Egypt all the way to Moab. Chapter 33 is a summary. Chapters 34 through 36 brings us to the end. And uh, something that's a little bit interesting The rules of the city of refuge in chapter 35, if a man kills somebody, he's called a manslayer, and he has to run away from the camp if you shed innocent blood, and you're supposed to go hide out in the wilderness. This is the rule for the manslayer. As long as you hide out in the wilderness, the avenger of blood, something like that, won't come after you if it was innocent. When the high priest dies in chapter 35, when the high priest dies, his blood covers the blood that, the, that these manslayers have shed. So when the high priest dies, the people that have shed innocent blood get to come back and take over their properties and come back and be safe. It's kind of interesting because there's a parallel. When the high priest dies, these people are forgiven, and Christ is the high priest in the New Testament. When he dies, all the people that are living under the law are freed. So the law represents the exiles, and the high priest represented Jesus and uh, Aaron. Then the book ends. These are the commandments and the rules, 36 and verse 1. These are the commandments, no, 13. The commandments and the rules that the Lord commanded through Moses to the people of Israel in the plains of Moab by the Jordan River, and they are on the east side looking over at Jericho. If they can look over at Jericho, Jericho is 17 miles east of Jerusalem. When Jesus was coming home from Jericho in his last triumphant march to Jerusalem, he marches from Jericho. He hits Bethany, which is where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lived. He'd always stay with them. He would come over. There's two miles from Bethany to Jerusalem. He would come over the Mount of Olives, and cresting the Mount of Olives, he could look down and see all of Jerusalem. And it says that Jesus wept. Because, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I have longed to gather you together like a hen gathers her chicks. But you were not willing. And Jesus, Jesus weeps. So that's it, guys. From Goshen in Genesis all the way to Moab in Numbers, we have about one year, oh, 40 years time. God has not given up on his people. That's amazing, isn't it? God has not given up on his people. Now, if we look back, when God told Israel to go in and take Canaan land, when we consider the earth that swallowed up all those people, the thousands and thousands of people that died by the plagues, all the wars and battles that they had to fight, the Canaanites, the Midianites, the Amorites, when we consider everything that happened to Israel, they fell into sin with the women, they sacrificed to idols. Wouldn't it have been better if they'd have just listened to God from the beginning? Yeah. Would it have just been easier to do it God's way? And that is the book of Numbers in one class.